Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Relationship Dynamics and Their Contribution to Adolescent Relationships and Dating Violence, hosted by the National Institute of Justice. At this time, I'd like to hand it off to Carrie Mulford of NIJ. Hi, I'm Carrie Mulford from NIJ, and I'm a social science analyst here, and I've been leading up our teen dating violence work for um, a little over a decade since we started doing this work and funding this work. Um, I wanted to pass along uh, the, a welcome from our acting director, Howard Spivak, who was really hoping to give a welcome himself, but is on a train, and we were concerned about his ability, the ability for you all to hear him. Um, but he is he wanted to pass along both his apologies for the techno technological difficulties and organizational difficulties that we had the last time around, um, and also to um, emphasize NIJ's commitment to this issue. Uh, I think um, the law the history of funding that we have on this topic uh, is a clear indication of our dedication, but he wanted to make sure that you all understood that we are we continue to be very dedicated to funding research on dating violence. Um, I'm also just want to, I'm just happy you could all join us today. Um, and this is a webinar series that we've been doing um, for about four years um, as a way of highlighting uh, teen dating violence research as part of um, Teen Dating Violence Awareness and Prevention Month, which was last month, that's the original date of our webinar. Um, and we like to both highlight the findings of the research and also talk about, um, have a practitioner talk about how those findings can be used in practice. Um, and we hope to have plenty of time at the end of the discussion today uh, to have some questions answered back and forth with the presenters. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Yansu Park, who's going to introduce our speakers. Hey everyone, my name is Yansu Park and I'm a visiting fellow at NIJ. I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our presenters today. Our first set of presenters today are Drs. Michael Lorber and Amy smith -Fleck. Dr. Lorber is a research scientist, adjunct professor, and director of developmental research at the Family Translational Research Group in the Department of Cariology and Comprehensive Care at New York University College of Dentistry. And Dr. smith -Fleck is a professor and lab director at the same group and institution. They're going to be discussing the role of negative interaction patterns in dating relationships and violence over time in adolescent dating couples. Our next set of presenters will be Drs. Megan Bear Merritt and Ty Reidenauer. Dr. Bear Merritt is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics at Boston University School of Medicine. And Dr. Ty Reidenauer is a developmental behavioral epidemiologist in the Behavior and Urban Health Program at RTI International. And th today, they are going to present findings about how daily changes in relational factors like feelings of jealousy, intimacy, and instruments of support are associated with dating violence victimization and perpetration in high-risk adolescent females. And today's last presenter is Kelly Miller, who is the Executive Director of the Idaho Coalition Against Sexual and Domestic Violence and oversees the social change and primary prevention strategies on gender violence with a focus on adolescent relationship abuse and sexual assault. She's going to provide an overview, overview of the possible impact of the presented research on primary prevention strategies on adolescent relationship abuse and how these studies can better inform approaches across the socio-ecological level. And with that, I will uh, turn, that, turn uh, it over to uh, Dr. Warber and Lisa Slep. Hi. So uh, this is Amy Flepp. Um, I'm going to start off our presentation today on relationship vulnerabilities um, and how those relate to teen dating violence. And this is work that Michael and I and our collaborator, Richard Heyman, and our group have been um, heading up. And it's a study that's ongoing. So you're getting an, a kind of a part way through update on the kinds of um, things that we're starting to find. So I'm sure everyone that is uh, listening is familiar with teen dating violence, um, but the reasons we think it's really important to get a better, uh, deeper understanding of what's going on in dating violence in teen couples is that um, even though people sometimes think that this is sort of uh, developmentally not a big deal, that teens are kids and, and their aggression sort of doesn't count, 
Um, the evidence does suggest that it is consequential. There are significant um, psychological and health consequences. There is a lot of stability in a course of aggression in relationships and um, victimization in relationships that can be traced to early teen dating relationships. Um, our thinking is that adolescence is this key developmental period where, where kids are learning what a romantic relationship, an intimate relationship is. And so um, there's a lot to suggest that in, in uh, older couples that folks kind of sort themselves to find partners that have an interaction style that meshes with what they have come to expect in dating partners. And so that means that in some ways, these early relationships are especially important to try to get off on a healthy, strong um, foot. And so the implications for preventing relationship violence are really greatest if you're thinking about teen dating violence. Yet it's a, a, um, a slice of relationship violence that has until relatively recently received a lot less attention than domestic violence among uh, you know, more stable older couples. In the area of teen dating violence, we have all focused as researchers a lot more on understanding individual risk factors. Um, so things that put teens at risk for either perpetrating aggression or being victim of aggression or both. And one of the things that has received less attention in these young relationships or relationships among young people is a kind of dyadic process or couple level variables. And this is important because, of course, dating violence by definition is happening within a couple interaction. It can't happen without the couple interacting with each other. Um, there has been relatively little direct observation of couples interacting with each other, especially in challenging situations as part of the, the research on dating violence among younger teens, teens that are not yet of college age. Um, and part of that is the challenge of conducting that sort of research. So we are focusing on trying to understand observable, relational vulnerabilities for dating violence. So are there interactional signatures that occur in teens' conflicts that are linked with a higher likelihood of escalating to some sort of aggression? We're particularly interested in something that's known in the um, broader literature on aggression as coercive process. This is a dyadic process where um, the interactants, some of this research was done with moms and kids, some of it's been done with couples, but the people engaged in, in a conflict have um, a history of winning the conflict by escalating. And a course of process is one where each person is trying to win by kind of taking things up a notch until somebody decides it's worth it to quit and then they give in. And so when that happens, they end up being able to turn off the other person's anger. And the other person ends up sort of winning the whole argument. And so both people end up being um, rewarded in a way for that otherwise kind of risky conflict style. Another interaction style that has been linked with aggression and in other kinds of relationships are when people get engaged in a power struggle and there's a demand withdraw kind of dynamic where one person is pushing, 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 and the more that person pushes, the more the other person backs off and won't engage and won't do what the, the, the first partner is asking for. In that situation, the person who's demanding often keeps going to try to get a reaction from the person who's withdrawing. And you can see how, again, that has potential to increase risk for aggression. So we've been um, in that we're still in the kind of the middle phase of conducting this research. We are bringing in couples where um, both partners are between the, well, at least one partner is between the age of 14 and 18 years, and where they've been dating for at least three months. 
because we want them to not be in the brand new stages of a relationship, but be in a place where they're starting to settle into their style with each other. We want, we're looking for couples where they have at least some history of conflict. And because of the observational coding that we do, they have to have the capacity to have an interaction in English so that we can track what's going on. Um, our research lab is in New York City, so these are kids that we are recruiting in and around the city. And so far, we have a sample of 112 couples. The average age is around 17. Um, we have a good amount of diversity, as you can see in that um, sample. They're about 50% Hispanic, but with a good mix um, of racial and ethnic diversity. And we also have diversity in sexual orientation in our sample. And with that, I am going to pass this to Michael. Okay, that looks like it worked. I am now the presenter. Advance to the next slide there. Did that advance for everybody? It looks good to me. Perfect. Okay, so we bring these couples um, into the laboratory and we have, have a three hour session with them. And during that session, um, they fill out uh, numerous questionnaires. Uh, both on aggression in their relationships as well as some risk factors and other things like demographics. But the main guts of the um, lab assessment is behavioral observation because what we're looking for are these objectively observable rela you know, uh, relational vulnerabilities. And so what we do is we observe them for each couple for roughly an hour. Um, we need to get a lot of observational data because the things that we're looking at primarily revolve around how kids handle conflicts. And so we need to give the opportunity for conflicts to occur. And because of that, we put them through a variety of, um, a variety of tasks. We start off with easy things and then they get progressively harder. Um, and what we, you know, uh, the classic one that we use, which has been used in prior research as well, is we identify their top issues in their relationship with one another and ask them to work it out, uh, try to work out those issues right then and there. We also do some things that involve um, various kind of games that end up being uh, challenging and a little stressful um, as well, involving uh, putting together a really difficult Lego model together with one hand behind their back each. Um, and there's a tangram task where people uh, have to teach one another how to build a, a puzzle. Uh, I won't go into the details of all that. Uh, I'm going to focus more on the uh, on the behaviors that we're observing. And by the way, these pictures are not our actual participants. Um, <clears throat> what we're measuring, um, uh, questionnaire-wise, when you know what I'll, what we'll be focusing on today, um, is uh, we're measuring the uh, we're measuring physical aggression using uh, FOSHI's safe date scales. Um, there are some example items there. They range from things that are pretty mild, like pushing and grabbing, to more severe like kicking and choking, and everything in between. And we ask about both perpetration and victimization. So for each partner, we're getting their reports of what they say they they've done to their partner and what their partner says they've done to them. Um, so we get two informants on each person. Um, as far as measures of the observational, you know, these observational measures of relationship processes, uh, we are using a coding system, the Rapid Marital Interaction Coding System, uh, to measure coercion-related things, um, and, as well as observer impressions uh, questionnaires that each coder fills out later, uh, and uh, and then this, a demand withdraw code. Uh, to get at those kind of uh, to get at the demand withdrawal processes that Amy described. So I'll turn to those next. Um, so to give you a flavor of of, of what's being measured, um, this helps you to understand what we mean when we say coercion. And the reason why we think it's important to to understand this at a, at a detailed level is because uh, ultimately when you're when you're doing an intervention with a couple. This, the, the behavioral specificity is where the rubber hits the road. So you need to, you know, we're trying to go beyond just saying, uh, you know, just looking at how mean kids are to one another in their conflicts with one another as a predictor of dating violence. We're looking at specific things, things that might even precede 
um, uh, uh, aggression itself. And so these are, so understanding specifically what are the things we're looking for is worthwhile, we think. Um, and so what coercion involves is this uh, increased, um, increased uh, propensity to start conflicts, and once you're in them, to reciprocate your partner's negativity. So when they do something mean, you respond meanly to them. Um, and, then, and then things escalate, and eventually somebody capitulates and gives in. And so the couple ends up getting negatively reinforced, this is a you know, behavioral term, uh, for, for, ending, for ending the conflict in a dysfunctional way. So both partners are, are getting uh, reinforced by escaping the conflict uh, through, this, uh, through, this, through these negative means. Um, <clears throat> so that gives you an idea of what we're looking at when we're looking at coercion. Um, and also, that, and, and those were, that was from the observer impressions questionnaire. The, um, we're also looking at the ratio of hostile to non-hostile behaviors using the RMX code, the rapid marital interaction coding system that I mentioned. Um, in there, we're looking at the ratio of hostile behaviors, like the ones you see there, to non-hostile behaviors during conflict episodes uh, with the idea that that is an expected output of coercion. So the, the more that you are reinforced for using aversive behaviors, you know, hostile behaviors, during conflict, the more they should happen relative to non-hostile ones during conflict. Um, <clears throat> the, the demand withdrawal pattern that Amy described, actually, that's, that's what it gets called in the literature, but it's, it's a little bit broader than that. It's actually demand and avoid and withdraw. So these are, as Amy said, when one person is pushing for change, that person is thought to be in the uh, less dominant position, less powerful, and the, and the person and in the, in the other partner is um, doing, uh, is, is either avoiding or minimizing or just frankly just shutting down and not giving, not, not ceding any space, um, not, not ceding to the partner's wishes. And uh, so that's a little bit more about what, we, uh, what we're observing with the demand withdrawal coding. Uh, <clears throat> And so just, we'll just briefly go over just a couple of results. We don't have much time and we're, we're only midway in the study. Um, but basically, you know, what we found, uh, what we're finding so far is that, you know, we, it supports our, uh, our interpretation of um, teen dating violence being a dyadic phenomenon. Basically, uh, it, it, first of all, 71% of the couples in this uh, sample so far uh, reported at least one person reported that some physical aggression had happened, and uh, when it happened, it was usually bilateral. It's usually both partners doing it. Um, so, so it supports the uh, this idea that dating violence is a dyadic phenomenon, and of course that makes it more important to understand what the dyadic dynamics are, which is what we're doing. Um, as far as the um, you know the the associations of what we were able to observe, these observed relational vulnerabilities. And, uh, and physical aggression uh, in, in the couples and you know, dating violence. Uh, basically everything is significant so far, um, which is kind of interesting. And it predicts both the aggression, uh, it predicts the aggression of both partners. Now partner ones are, are, mostly, uh, are mostly females and partner twos are mostly males. Of course we have some same sex couples in there too, so it's not 100% that way, but by and large partner Partner one is typically, uh, part, so if you read that, partner one to partner two is primarily female to male aggression, and partner two to partner one is primarily uh, male to female aggression. And so what we see is that, um, you know, every measure that we have um, predicts physical, the physical aggression of both partners. Um, and um, we, we see that when it comes to the, uh, you know, so, uh, and, and the, the subcomponents of those behavior patterns that I mentioned also predict. So it's not only that the overall hostile to non-hostile balance during conflicts matters, for example. It is, it is also that the hostile, just the rate of hostile behaviors all by themselves and the rate of non-hostile behaviors all by themselves are individually predictive of both partners' aggression. Similarly, when it comes to demand and avoid withdrawal pattern, um, Demand a little bit more strongly seems to predict be, seems to be predicting aggression, but it's also the case that avoiding and withdrawing um, also give you some prediction of, of physical aggression. Um, and 
I'm and in, in, in both partners. So I'm going to I'm going to pass the ball back to Amy for discussion of our findings. Okay, so um, our data so far do suggest that dating violence has a strong dyadic component, that it's not merely individual risk and protective factors that contribute to uh, risk for dating violence, but also aspects of the way the couple interacts with each other. Um, as Michael said, we have evidence of so far of at least some preliminary suggestion that both coercive process and the demand avoid and withdraw the types of behaviors are all um, linked with risk for aggression. And it suggests that there's importance not only in um, understanding kind of the topography of aggressive behavior, but the process of how conflict is handled in couples both um, when it escalates to aggression and when it doesn't. And it's important to note that these relational processes look like um, they confer risk both for the girls and the guys in our sample. So um, the kinds of implications, uh, we don't want to get too ahead of ourselves since we're in the middle of the study still. But the kinds of things that we're thinking about in terms of potential implications from our study um, stem from this focus on uh, the importance of, of dyadic process. So most of our current um, dating violence prevention efforts are aimed appropriately at helping teens address the risk and protective factors that they bring into the relationships that they're about to have. So a lot of our um, our current protect our, our current factor or prevention programs that are out there that have evidence behind them focus on things like attitudes about aggression, teaching people about help seeking, teaching people what to do if they find themselves in an aggressive relationship, giving people some degree of conflict management skills, we think it could be that we'll be able to further enhance the impact of those kinds of prevention efforts if we can also help kids learn about um, dyadic interaction patterns. And if we can figure out from research like ours and like other people are doing, um, what the interaction patterns are that when you put two people together and they're having an argument, if it looks like this, it's at much higher risk to uh, escalate to aggression. If it looks like that, it's not. And so then it's possible that we could teach folks in a more um, detailed and in some ways more specific way about what functional ways of dealing with a conflict when they find themselves in one might be. So our study is ongoing. Um, we're only about halfway through, a little more than halfway through. And so we'll be collecting a lot more observational data and we're doing a lot more coding. So we'll be able to layer in some other kinds of, um, of, uh, of observed conflict behaviors. And we also have a focus on how couples get out of conflicts. And so we're hoping that we'll be able to do more with that. And we'll be following our couples up um, for a year after their initial visit into the lab. So we'll also be able to look and see how their conflict signature at the point that they join us for the study ends up impacting the course of their relationship over time. So ultimately, we're thinking not that these relational processes are going to supersede all the other kinds of risk and protective factors that we all know about and are interacting with in our prevention and outreach programs just that these will potentially be one more pathway. So it might be an additional leverage point. Um, so you can see here that we're seeing these as embedded within that larger context of other kinds of risk and protective factors. And we just want to thank NIJ um, and the National Institutes of Health because they, they helped us with kicking off the project. Uh, with conducting this research, and you can see the names of some of the people who um, are instrumental in us working with, with these teams and getting them in and getting those data. 
And uh, that is a summary of our study. So I believe next it's going to Megan. Um, so thanks to everybody who took time out of their uh, day to be here to, to listen to the presentations and also to NIJ for hosting us. And I think um, our research follows very nicely from Michael and from uh, Amy's in that we similarly were interested in uh, relational context and teen dating violence episodes. Um, so it's probably not a surprise um, to this group how common teen dating violence is, and depending if uh, people are looking at physical violence or emotional abuse, uh, rates seem to be that about 10 to 25 percent of adolescents uh, report some form of abuse in their romantic relationships in the past year. Um, and, and because of this, many people in the field are, are working to prevent and, and work with um, young people who are in violent relationships, and, and there have been um, evidence-based prevention programs and interventions that have been developed, um, but I think we probably in these programs don't focus enough on the complexities of the romantic relationship, and so uh, part of the goal of our study was to understand this relationship context uh, better. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's true of every relationship, um, including those with violence, um, that there's sort of, there can be the violence, but um, Adults and adolescents alike also simultaneously report closeness and trust and commitments. And so it's not sort of a monolithically negative relationship, but there are these more positive qualities as well. Um, I think sometimes we, we discount adolescent relationships and talk about them as infatuations or they sort of come and go, but um, adolescents really are very highly invested in their main partner and that affects um, kind of how they react to the violence. And so um, within the context of thinking about sort of how to talk to adolescents about these relationships, how to develop prevention programs, we need to be thinking about ad adolescent development. Um, and in particular, adolescents uh, tend to be more likely than adults to kind of minimize disagreements. Um, they haven't just had as much life experience about how to negotiate conflicts, how to sort of resolve feeling jealous or these sort of other emotions. Um, in some evidence, particularly, um, there's been a fair amount of work in the field of um, sexually transmitted diseases and, and condom use um, that adolescents actually, when there's been what people call a rupture or something, an insult to the relationship, a big fight, um, concerns about a partner having another partner, um, sometimes adolescents actually try to pull that partner closer rather than separating. And, and so these are all things that we felt like we needed to understand um, in terms of uh, developing intervention programs. Um, so really sort of our overarching goal was to try to get information in this study that would hopefully be ha helpful for advocates, people who are um, working on the ground uh, with adolescents who are in relationships with violence and with the um, sort of generally with the adults who support these adolescents. Um, I think one note, um, within sort of the teen dating violence world, much of what's been done has been done on um, kind of upper middle class, predominantly uh, white um, adolescents, and so there really is a paucity of literature. Um, there's, there's not diverse voice or perspective, and there's a paucity of literature in particular um, for adolescents of color. Um, so the questions that we were asking is actually sort of on a day-to-day -day basis. How does an adolescent's feelings of closeness, trust, commitment, or jealousy, um, and what we call provision of instrumental support, so giving a gift, giving, a, giving money, um, something like that, how does that relate to episodes of teen dating violence victimization? And, and in there, is there a window for intervention? So um, we asked questions um, like, when an adolescent is reporting, um, when an adolescent experiences victimization on that day, on the day before, how is she reporting that she trusts that person or does that trust perhaps uh, dip for a bit? Um, are there feelings of jealousy um, that kind of go way up that could predict almost a, a day of uh, an incident of violence on the next day? Um, so our objective in the study was to determine uh, the associations between actual events of teen dating violence uh, victimization and adolescence reports about closeness, uh, jealousy, commitment, um, and the and trust in the provision of instrumental support on the day right before a violent event um, and the day of a violent event. Um, so we, we have uh, completed um, the study. We recruited a cohort of um, young adolescent women from Baltimore 
uh, one of the things that was really important to us um, is that many of the studies um, that exist out there um, recruit either from mostly from colleges or from schools, and we felt like it was important to have a community, uh, an approach where we were really sort of in the community. And so we actually had a research van um, where we identified where adolescents tended to congregate, and the research van went out at night and on weekends um, and recruited from community venues. Um, to be eligible for our study, you had to be a young woman uh, between the ages of 16 and 19. Um, you had to be English speaking, although predominantly um, the large percentage of um, adolescents in Baltimore actually are English speaking, um, and a resident of Baltimore City, and you had to have disclosed uh, teen dating violence in a current relationship. For this study, we focused on male partners, but certainly um, there's a need to look at violence within same-sex relationships. Um, adolescents provided written informed consent um, and the whole actual consent procedure. We went through three institutional uh, review boards, to, um, which is interesting in and of itself, but a discussion for perhaps another time. Um, so when adolescents came um, and were eligible and interested and provided consent for the study, um, they did a pretty comprehensive baseline survey. An ACASI is a computer-assisted survey, so they actually, for privacy, uh, listened in and the questions were read to them and then they input the data directly into a computer. Um, and then uh, during the course of the study, which lasted four months, every night, uh, the young woman received a very nonspecific text. It just said, um, you know, go to your heart survey, um, and they could link on that button uh, on uh, their phone, and it went took them to a website. Nobody could get into the website. You had to put in a unique passcode that only the young woman knew. Um, and then it went through um, a number of questions that asked both about if uh, the young woman was with the same partner, if she had spent time with that partner, um, about physical, emotional abuse and threats, um, both that her partner had done to her and that she had done to her partner, and then also how she was feeling in terms of trust, uh, commitment, closeness, jealousy, um, and whether or not there was any instrumental support that she had given to her partner or that her partner had given to him. And so every day uh, we have a sense of how she was feeling about her partner and whether or not there were any uh, violent events. Um, so these just show the uh, questions that the young women were answering every night. So we asked, um, in terms of closeness, how close do you feel toward him? Uh, so the response options, and they could just tap on their phone. So the survey, um, we estimated, took kind of two to three minutes a night. Um, so they could respond very close, somewhat close, not close at all. Um, how much do you trust him? Trust him a lot, trust him somewhat, do not trust him at all. How committed do you feel to him? Very committed to him, somewhat committed to him, or not committed to him at all? Um, do you feel jealous of any other girls he might be talking to or hanging out of, hanging out with? Or does he feel jealous of any other boys you might be talking to or hanging out with? And they responded yes or no to those uh, two questions. Um, in terms of uh, this construct of instrumental support. We said, has he given you any money or gifts uh, since this time yesterday? And have you given him any money or gifts uh, since this time yesterday? Um, in terms of teen dating violence victimization, we asked, has he threatened uh, to hit, punch, kick, or hurt, and that's supposed to be you, since this time yesterday? Has he pushed, shoved, grabbed, slapped, hit, or kicked you since this time yesterday? And has he called you fat, ugly, stupid, or some other insult uh, since this time yesterday? These were based um, as well on the, the safe date scale. Um, and so really we were, the dependent variable or our outcome was on a day where there was a teen dating violence episode. Uh, was there anything that happened the day before that predicted uh, that teen dating violence episode? And, and how did the young woman report feeling on that same day? Um, so this is just a visual uh, way to think about that. So we looked at the each um, independent uh, event and then looked at the prior day and we are uh, doing analyses right now so they're not part of this talk to see what happened the day following a violent event. Um, so I am going to uh, pass the ball over to um, Ty who has helped us uh, tremendously with the analysis um, and he is going to uh, present the analysis part. So it should be passed over. Um, so in a moment we'll be 
I will briefly describe the statistics that were used. It's good, just going to be a spot that we put up there and move on. Um, that's primarily going to be for researchers that are attending the webinar. Uh, however, it is important to understand in English what it is that we're looking at, and that's what this slide and the next one will be depicting. If you look at the slides on the left side under Participant A, these are graphs of the data that were reported from day 0 to day 120 about her own behavior and her partner's behavior that's listed under his behavior. And they depict either a type of teen dating violence occurring at the no incident or bottom of those lines, or whether there was some form of perpetration that occurred in the form of name calling, threatening, or pushing and hitting, and they're color coded as you can see down below. <clears throat> and the lines as they go up, they indicate each day when a type of teen violence had occurred. If you notice uh, for the graphs there for participant A, from a, a, during about the first five days, both the girl and the boy in this couple exhibited teen dating violence. And then there was a bit of a lull, although she engaged in name calling, you can see with the red line. And then another flurry of teen dating violence behaviors occurred from about days 15 to 25. Then there was a, a, an extended period of no teen dating violence or very little of it um, from both of the members of the couple. And so in this way, their behaviors are associated and we would quantify that in the same way as a correlation. If you now move over to participant B's couple, um, it's easy to see that the males and females teen dating violence here are also correlated, and so they're correlated um, across the two couples, but you can also see that they both, the two couples rather, differ in terms of how frequently teen dating violence occurs and the types of behaviors that they engage in. And so the results that we'll be showing are the strengths of associations between the emotional and behavioral characteristics and his tendency to engage in teen dating violence or his exhibiting teen dating violence, as well as whether they differ between couples or among the couples that are in the sample. In this graph, we're looking at the same data, but in a slightly different way. Um, and here are the same two couples but now the graphs show counts of the types of teen dating violence that each of the members, members in a couple exhibited. Um, so in the last slide, the lines sometimes overlapped, making it hard to see what types of behaviors were occurring on a particular day. And here we can get a sense for the amount of teen dating violences that occurred. Um, and here again, you can see there are some similarities in that the blue and red lines tend to follow each other, um, but uh, in couple A, her types of, per of perpetuations of teen dating violence tend to be um, greater in volume than his, whereas in couple B, his teen dating violence behaviors tend to be um, greater in terms of the number of types. And so here again, it just illustrates the notion that we can take some results and generalize them across couples, but there also are differences between the couples, and that's what we aim to quantify in the analysis. So as I mentioned, this slide is primarily for researchers or statisticians. Um, the approach, general approach that we're taking is hierarchical linear modeling. I'm not going to go into great detail here. I'm going to trust that those who are familiar with it know it, and hopefully we can pull out of the results what is meaningful for everyone. Um, one thing that I do want to point out is that the error term at the end includes autocorrelation, and so that's pulled out of the results for a statistician. That's an important point. Uh, the bottom line here is that the results that we'll be reporting can be understood like correlations or regression coefficients, but they're pertaining to correlations within couples over time as opposed to across a whole sample. And some of the reasons that we do this, this is entirely for statisticians and researchers is that it controls for autocorrelation, as I mentioned. It's free from potential biases that occur with alternative analytic approaches. It's tailored for conservative statistical testing and the estimates that we get. It also handles missing data well. 
and it's a powerful analytic technique for comparing subgroups, which down the road um, we will be doing, trying to look for subtypes of couples and understand their differences better. And I'm going to pass this over now to back to Megan to go over the first part of the results. Great. Thanks, Ty. Um, so we recruited 158 young women. Uh, the average age in years uh, was 18.1. 92% of the young women um, who participated in the study um, identified as being African American, and 69% 60, of them, when we asked about their mother's education, uh, told us that their uh, mothers had, were either high school graduates or less. Um, during those uh, baseline interviews where young women um, responded on the computer, we asked them about the past month uh, of violence with their partner. Um, including victimization and perpetration. Um, you will see that kind of all of the things we asked about were fairly common, um, including psychological abuse, uh, being called fat, ugly, stupid, uh, being threatened. Uh, there was a, about a quarter of them reported uh, recent physical violence, um, including about 10%, just a little under who had um, punched, choked, bit, or kicked, been punched, choked, bitten or kicked or had done that to their partners, um, and particularly uh, with regard to themselves, had been made uh, to feel afraid. Um, so we are going back and forth a bit, but I'm going to pass the ball back to Ty to tell you a little bit about the analysis where we looked at predictors of next day and same day uh, violence. Got it. Thank you, Megan. Um, we'll start in the column that's labeled previous day. Uh, it's probably, it would have been better to label this next day. I apologize about that. But the numbers here present how strongly each of the listed emotional and behavioral characteristics on one day predict the male's teen dating violence on the next day. Uh, so feeling close and trusting are statistically associated with the boy's uh, dating violence the next day with trust being a slightly better predictor, as you can see by comparing the, co the numbers there. Um, then over in the same day column, these are associations between those emotional and behavioral characteristics and the male's teen dating violence that are occurring on the same day. Uh, the black coefficients that are shown indicate that there is not a significant variation in those numbers or in those relations between the variables among the couples or across the couples. If there's a green coefficient, it indicates that couples vary uh, significantly in that association. So for example, on the same day, that closeness coefficient of 0 0.074 is statistically significant, um, and it shows that by the three stars, but that number of generalizes across all couples. That association is consistent for the most part across all of them. When we go down to trust in the next row, that's the average number, but it differs significantly among the couples. And so there's a variability there and maybe a difference between couples that needs to be better understood. Um, some of the takeaways from these results is that previous day predictors of the male's violence are most strongly associated or most strongly predicted by her level of jealousy, by her own perpetration of dating violence, and then by her level of trust, which is kind of interesting and unexpected that the th that a higher level of trust would be a predictor of violence the next day. When we go over to the same day column, um, there are about four takeaways here. One is that all the associations are considerably larger than the previous day predictions. The greatest predictor for his teen dating violence on that same day is her teen dating violence, her level of jealousy, and his level of jealousy. So, it's interesting here, similar to the previous talk, that all of the predictors were associated with next day and same day victimization. The three strongest predictors of next day victimization 
of his, the boy's next day victimization were the female's perpetration, her level of jealousy, and her trust with partner, with higher trust being associated with greater risk of his teen dating violence. And then the associations that were predicting next day were increased two to ten times when predicting same day victimization. Um, suggesting that the victimization or the perpetration that occurs escalates rapidly uh, on that same day between both partners and are associated with pretty strong emotions. The three strongest predictors of same-day victimization were the female's own um, teen dating violence and both partners' levels of jealousy. It's interesting that the reported trust and commitment were negatively correlated on the same day, but that the women reported a greater closeness and provision of instrumental support on that same day as the teen, as the male stating violence. And for to try to make sense of all this, I'm going to pass it back to Megan. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, our biggest conclusions, and, and certainly uh, really are that we need to understand this better, that, that clearly Violence occurs within adolescent relationships um, amidst many complicated emotions. Um, and so there's this interrelationship that I think we knew about between perpetration and victimization. Um, I think it's somewhat less surprising that when um, there are strong feelings of jealousy, it's, it's a predictor of violence. But I think um, it's important in thinking about how do we counsel adolescents, how do we intervene, how do we prevent teen dating violence, um, this idea that actually as adolescents uh, reported much more trust uh, with their partner, it, it put them at risk. Um, it, and that even sort of in the face, in the moment of an episode of, of violence, uh, they don't report differences in how closely uh, or how close they feel to that partner. And um, I think these are all important considerations in, in thinking about how uh, we talk about relationships, how we talk about healthy relationships, how we um, work with adolescents to uh, be sort of strong advocates for themselves. Um, so, as with any study, we clearly have limitations. Um, for us, our next steps really deal with analysis, and we are looking forward um, to examining uh, young women's perpetration and this uh, sort of similar predictors and correlates for that. Um, we will be looking at how young women tell us they feel the day after a violent event um, and beginning to break up a little bit some of the psychological versus physical dating violence events to see if we see different patterns. Um, also, as Ty suggested, um, there seems to be things that are going on kind of commonly across couples and then some couple, some variation between couples, and, and we'll begin to look at that and to, um, we also have some ability to look within one young woman, if she had multiple partners, how those uh, different relationships unfold over time. Um, you know, sort of always a concern is missing data. Um, our young women um, were sort of amazing. They responded to the Daily Diaries most days of the week, um, and so we feel very fortunate to have such complete data. Um, and, you know, this is obviously a more, um, a harder to reach population, but we feel like it's really important to have uh, their voice um, in the literature as well and to have more diverse voices. Um, for us, the implications, as um, we have said, is that we, we really need to be sort of thinking about these emotional and including kind of positive feelings um, in the complexity of these relationships. Um, and that we need to continue to obtain a more granular understanding of how uh, violence unfolds uh, within relationships uh, for adolescents to develop um, and build programs that are appropriate for adolescent development. Um, we want to thank uh, the National Institute of Justice, who's been so supportive. Um, we had an amazing field team led by Eddie Poole. Um, we want to thank our participants who spent four months with us uh, and trusted us enough to give us uh, these data. And um, my co-principal investigator is also funded by NIH by NIDA. Um, so with that, I'm going to um, pass uh, the ball over. And I believe I'm passing it to Kelly. Thanks, Megan. I'm just making sure. Thank you, Megan, so much for passing it over. Uh, just doing a quick check to make sure you can hear me. Uh, this is Kelly Miller with the Idaho Coalition, and I'm just uh, just thank you to the MIJ for like bringing everyone together, and it's just um, actually very exciting 
as a practitioner to see as studies are beginning to unfold. So uh, kudos to all the, the researchers for, you know, coming on and talking about where their studies are going right now. Um, one of the things I want to start out with is just talking about um, how it is so essential that research is developing and informing uh, implementation of multi-layer prevention approaches that are happening right now in schools and out of school settings, after school settings, and how this can be a relationship where both researchers are informing prevention uh, strategies and approaches as well as practitioners informing research. The thing I want to say at the outset, um, I am just really um, appreciative of all of the researchers, Megan, Ty, and everyone talking about how adolescent relationship abuse or teen dating violence is consequential. I think there's a certain element of adultism uh, within the anti-violence field that I think we're beginning to overcome, and I think a lot of that's come out of some of the CBC studies that show how early perpetration, early experiences of abuse and sexual assault are actually impacted um, throughout a young person's life into adulthood. And from a practitioner standpoint, I mean, it makes sense. I can think of so many uh, women I talked to in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, and that was, of course, not their first incident of an abusive relationship in most circumstances that did begin in adolescence. So I think it's just um, great. I mean, what they did talk about, which is so true, is that there really is significant gaps in current research that can, can help inform how prevention works across the socio-ecological model from the individual risk factors and protective factors to this being really focused on relational and how that works in concert with both community and institutional uh, approaches as well as the ones at the societal level and looking at societal norms and the ways that other ways that we devalue girls and women in particular in our culture as well as we devalue individuals based on race, sexual orientation, and many other identities and how this all can work together. So the other thing I want to give appreciation for is that all the researchers understood that this is not uh, in any way going to like remedy all of ending teen dating violence, but it is an important element. And all of the practitioners that are really working from a sense of the socio-ecological model know that work needs to be done and research needs to be done around the research uh, around relationships. The other aspect is um, I thought it was fascinating in the studies uh, that everyone really talked about the importance of adolescent development in terms of the studies. A lot of the practitioners are engaging, and there's been a shift over the last decade, uh, a lot uh, in middle schools. We found that at, from a development standpoint, that's really an opportune time to begin to really establish social norms around relationships and healthy relationships. And I'm thinking of the Start Strong work, I'm thinking of Safe Dates and Fourth R, all of which are really targeting particularly that audience. Um, and how these particular studies are a little bit older adolescents and just really going to be curious on how that's going to help inform and really illuminate things that we can be doing uh, within middle school and high school uh, prevention interventions. So when I think about this, I mean, from a practitioner standpoint, uh, just really understanding the youth characteristics and adolescent relationship abuse experiences and how youth are affected by programming, that's so important. And I think this research is going to be really exciting as it continues to unfold. I think the, um, the aspect from a practitioner is eventually when the research is done from both entities and they, and they have the outcomes that can help inform what prevention would look like, we still as practitioners have to keep in mind that there's so many other aspects we always have to hold, uh, including what context are you working in, what else is happening in your community that could shape outcomes and pathways to really reducing teen dating violence. Uh, the piece I also want to like appreciate is that both of these studies, the first study really had a really high proportion of youth from Hispanic and Latina uh, communities and the second study from African American and black communities, I mean, which is a really, there's a, such a lack of research, you know, when we think about teen dating violence and historically marginalized communities. So I also want to be thinking about what does this mean for prevention approaches? Because when we look at the data in terms of the prevalence of teen dating violence, we know when we start looking uh, beyond the universal data to the data that's really specific to Latino population, 
Native American populations, the black, black girls, uh, girls with disabilities, the LGBTQ population, that there is a higher prevalence of dating abuse. And so what does that mean? I think it's great that these studies are doing that. And as a practitioner, I would want to make sure, too, that that cultural, that um, understanding of the historical marginalization and what's happening and what we're talking about so much in our country is taken into account as well as we're figuring out what does all this mean. From a practitioner standpoint, those, some of those slides were like giving me chest pains. They were so amazing and I wouldn't have understood what they meant at all and because I have never taken statistics. So, but as protect practitioners, there's things that we can do to really inform our own uh, analysis of how do we look at research with a critical lens? How do we look at it with bringing what we know about being a practitioner and working in, in schools and after school programs with young people? Um, so I, I think just a quick tips First and foremost, when you, any practitioner is looking at research and these studies, I'm sure eventually will end up in peer reviewed journals and we'll have papers to look at. So but in the meantime, you always want to be thinking about what's the question they're trying to answer. And I think for me, the question that both um, bodies of research that are ongoing are really looking at what about that relational level in the socio-ecological model? How can we pay attention to that and learn from that to begin to inform our prevention work? The second piece you want to see, are there like specific questions? You could see that the research is beginning to drill down on questions around, you know, what does it mean around coercion and withdrawing and what does it mean around jealousy? And so as a practitioner, always try to like be thinking about what is it that they're asking for? What are they trying to figure out? With regard to the approach and method, I mean, I think there's things that we can do and things as practitioners. Uh, that we probably can't do unless you, you know, have a research background that has statistics and understand that. What I really, really encourage practitioners that are working in community um, and tribal domestic and sexual violence programs within state coalitions or other anti-violence organizations is to build a relationship with someone in your community that has this expertise. I think having that academic and particularly academic institutions are a just a huge resource for us and having that partnership so you can have a relationship with someone who does this that understands statistics and research and analysis to say, help me make sense of this. I think that for me and for our organization has always been essential. So but in terms of your reading figures and tables, those generally will tell you um, that there's things that you need to be paying attention to. So when you know, Megan and Ty, uh, Michael and Amy were all talking about things that were significant. That actually has meaning within the research community. And so understanding if something is significant or non-significant, they have precise statistical meanings. And you want to learn more about what does that mean. I think in the end, you want to look at the, the research and when these come out in papers, you want to be asking, did they actually answer the specific questions that they intended to ask and answer? And so that will help you um, just think about it. And it's okay if you change your mind with the author's interpretation if you're reading papers. And if you're still a beginner at analysis, it's okay to kind of ask others and say, what do you think of this? And really don't dispel your own lived experience in having working directly with survivors of teen dating violence or intimate partner violence or sexual assault. I think in the end, you have to come up with your own assessment of whether or not you agree with a conclusion or not. In this particular instance, both of the bodies of research are ongoing, and you can see where they have some emerging themes that are coming up that we can begin to explore, but without having the solid final outcomes, all of this right now is, is more about questions that we might have as practitioners and trying to figure out, okay, what can we learn from this? When do we need to see more? Um, and what can we actually begin to maybe even think about changing now? When I looked at the studies, um, these were super exciting. I, I think the, the NYU study and talking about uh, vulnerabilities, and I think of those as also as risk factors. I think both Michael and Amy talked a little bit about risk factors as well. This concept around what are those risk factors for teen dating violence that become a basis for targeted intervention and focusing on those risk, risk factors around the relationship context of a, a teen dating violence relationship. That was a lot of relationships in one sentence. Um, so 
the concepts around coercion and demand, avoid and withdraw, I think that's uh, going to be a fascinating area for us to continue to learn, learn from. What does that mean? I think the questions, and I really appreciated the way that um, they talked about the demand, avoid and withdraw, and the coercion aspect is conflict escalation. I think that would make sense to practitioners in terms of when are things getting worse, when are things escalating, and that's something certainly within intimate partner violence we've, we've done a lot of research on. Um, I think it's so important that we don't conflate research with adults and intimate partner violence, but we can still learn from it when we get stuck. And so one of the questions I would have as a practitioner when we're thinking about dietic or this, this idea of this couples, um, how do we look at it as couples, I'm just curious about this particular research and if it's going to be going along the same lines as some of the research with adults around couples intervention. And for those that have been working in intimate partner violence work, you know, the couples intervention piece has been really complicated in terms of do we have a really deep enough understanding to know what's at play? In other words, when we're talking about, in this particular study, physically aggressive couples and the unilateral versus bilateral, the study that came to mind for me was Michael Johnson's work around intimate partner terrorism, uh, which shows that those are most of the folks that are actually seeking services, and that would be like the unilateral, when you have one partner that's abusive or exerting physically aggressive behaviors as compared to the bilateral. And so the other kind of big question I know that we've been wrestling with for some time now is just the con context. I mean, one of the things I've been doing this work for over 30 years, and I will tell you that it's the understanding and the complexities of human relationships and what's happening, and also in the context of societal norms, it's so complicated. And so what is the, um, the role or the non-role of self-defense. And when I think about gender parity, some of the things that have come up, it's also shown in other studies that female, females are more likely to report aggressive behavior that might otherwise have been considered self-defense by somebody else than, than males. And how does that play into the study and what, what's the impact? I was curious though because NYU study, unless I'm getting this wrong, it sounded like it was very much from observable they were looking at the couples for an hour. The other piece I would say from that study that could be really um, interesting in terms of how it might inform prevention work when they talked, and Michael, I think in particular, talked about, you know, they observed folks for an hour, they had different activities and games. Like, are there different circumstances that we could recreate within a classroom or a group setting where there's, um, where we're looking at how individuals are going through this activity and really stopping and doing role playing along the way about what uh, some of those non-hostile criteria that they listed in terms of negotiating conflict, what would that look like? So I don't know exactly what the games were or the activities um, that they're using, but I mean, those are some of the kind of deeper questions when I think about research. What is it that we can replicate within a classroom setting or uh, after classroom setting to think about how can we actually recreate opportunities for people to, young people to practice uh, what normally are called like conflict or role playing skills. I know in particular I think about the fourth R out of Canada, David Wolf's curriculum has a great deal of uh, role play and it just feels like some of the role play around some of the the questions that they're asking out of the NYU research could be really fruitful. I think for me, um, it, it is kind of a big question though around the unilateral versus bilateral and, and really kind of unpacking what is the context of that. And, and so for the researchers always thinking about that, um, I know that they, they had talked about observable behaviors. And so what do those look like in terms of escalation? and and then I think the other complexity, and this goes with both, um, both the NYU research and the research coming out of Boston Public Health and RTI, that how do we address all of this when so much of our societal culture is really built around domination, extraction, and violence? And when I think particularly about young people and the exposure um, to the way that conflict is, is 
have handled well, you know, we're not talking about either within song lyrics or television shows or movies. I mean, it's just we have so much to undo in our culture in terms of what really interdependent, resilient, healthy behaviors might look like. I think the last thing I would point out in terms of the NYU study, again, over 50% were Hispanic or Latino, and just what are the cultural implications? I mean, I would be super curious if they're unpacking some of that. You know, what, you know, what have been the norms within their family structures in terms of how do you handle conflict, how do you handle violence? Um, and so I think those are just some really important things for us to be thinking about. For the other study, I would talk about, um, gosh, that Megan and Ty were talking around, I think it's super interesting that they're looking at the, the lifespan of a, a relationship where there already had been a disclosure of teen dating violence. And again, this was a little bit older group. At 18, I believe, was about the average age. And so what does that mean in terms of if we can look at the context and how are we going to have interventions? I think from a practitioner, the piece that gets really um, complicated for me is when you look at the research around disclosures, right, of teen dating violence, most often young people are disclosing to other peers. So the question for this as a practitioner, if this information shows outcomes that there are predictive behaviors, how do we actually help other peers to understand? And then this comes into play, what does bystander intervention look like? And I think about Green Dot and some of the other kinds of uh, great curriculum out there and how do we actually uh, make this meaningful in, in bystander intervention? Because if we're looking at the lifespan, not likely, unless these are really clear observable behaviors, that you're going to have intervention uh, at a school level or any other kind of institutional or community level. And so what does that look like? Or is it actually helping to inform individual youth kind of what are kind of some of the predictors of what might happen? I think in this particular study, the predictor of violence around jealousy is something that's also going to be complicated in terms of prevention work. What does that look like? Um, it's not unusual for young people to um, equate jealousy with forms of, of affection and love. And a lot of that's because that's what a popular culture has really done. And so, again, we have a, a huge, like, hurdle to overcome about how are we going to really think about jealousy in a way and help them with critical thinking to understand, you know, what are healthy boundaries. And I know many curriculums, I think of Safe Dates and Fourth R and others, talk about things like that, but how are we going to tease out the difference between what jealousy is versus not? Um, again, this particular one was interesting with the automated survey and just having young people, like, responding uh, in the way that they were. The other piece I would just say from a practitioner standpoint is just to highlight, I mean, this was a study, and I really appreciate that it is particularly um, focused on a historically marginalized community of black young people. And I just want us to also be really conscious as any of these times when we're coming up with studies that are showing indicators, maybe even without context, about um, co-occurrence of physical aggression that we need to be really cautious around school-to-prison pipeline. And the reason I say that is a lot of the work done by Francine Sherman and others tells us that particularly young black girls are actually um, forced or sent into juvenile detention processes for a lot less behaviors than uh, young boys or boys. And so I just want us to also be always conscious about unintended impacts, about the way that we're um, – you know, contextualizing when we're talking about co-occurrence or um, just talking about the way that violence occurs. And so I think that's just uh, kind of a side note, but something that I was thinking about as folks were talking today is that I don't think that the attention for all of us would not be create any kind of um, studies or processes that would validate or indicate why we should be over-incarcerating young people of color in particular. So what are the like last few notes I would say around implications? I mean, we know that prevention should begin in early in life, so I'm really hoping that both of these studies can help us understand how can we can take what they're learning and integrate it into middle school curriculum. I mean, over the time period that many practitioners have been doing this work, the focus used to be on high school, now it's much more middle school through high school. 
And I suspect that, you know, many are moving now more into into elementary school. So how can we, like, you know, bring all of this together and make sense of it in ways that um, can really inform our prevention work? I think the, the point that many of the practitioners have made that adolescent social norms are different than adult dynamics, but they have also really been clear about the importance of these relationships to young people. I think that is another certain element that we tend to like dismiss teen dating violence. If I think about the anti-violence field across the country, it is really predominantly adult focused. And if we really begin to lift up the impact and the long-term consequences that all of the researchers spoke of, I think that can be really helpful in really opening up uh, how we really create our field and what we are providing access to in terms of young people, and particularly historically marginalized communities. I think the last piece I want to touch base again on the bilateral versus unilateral aggression. And I have to be honest, some of that makes me nervous in terms of I just want to make sure that we're not missing any kind of contextual information that we would need to know. Uh, when it's bilateral, you have both parties who are being aggressive. You know, is any of it within something that would be closer to a self-defense or um, in response to what the, I'd be curious about the co-occurrence of the jealousy and what does that mean? Does it mean that um, if it is this phenomenon, and, I, and you know, I'm curious about the word phenomenon because I also feel like none of this happens in isolation, that while there can be certain significant findings from these studies, that we can never be, forget that the young people are also having in these relationships in the context of broader societal norms and what's happening in a school culture, what's happening in their neighborhoods, what's happening in communities across our country in terms of who are we valuing, who are we not valuing. I think the other piece is what does this mean in terms of programming? I, I mean, I think the thing that many practitioners are finding, there had been a great deal of focus around individual and relational interventions, and we really had to pay more attention to the community and institutional interventions and the societal interventions to really change norms, to really shape and really have a difference around teen dating violence and all forms of gender violence, frankly. And so things like that are um, big questions I still have about what are the implications for the study. And again, the whole concept around the coercion, demand, avoid, and withdraw and programming. I think there's a lot of richness in both studies that we can begin to learn from, and we'll be excited to hear kind of where, where they go. The last piece, again, just highlighting the um, aspect around jealousy, I think this is going to be really tough. Um, I think we've been trying to do that, particularly around technology um, and, you know, just cell phone use and social media use and what are healthy boundaries around that. Um, I think of a lot of work around jealousy that has been done along the lines with popular culture. I mean, back when all of the uh, Twilight books were coming out and movies, there were really, really unhealthy models of relationships that were really embedded in jealousy, and but that was really lifted up as something to, to I don't know, to strive for. So it's like we're going to have a lot of work to do around that as well. But the more we can kind of tease out what does this jealousy look like, and I'm hoping the study can go there uh, and, and really inform kind of the prevention work that we do, I think that would be super great. And I think that's yeah, I want to make sure there's enough time for questions, Michelle, so I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. This is Carrie. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, thank you to all of the presenters. That was been really, really fantastic. Um, I actually wanted to give, um, ask, first of all, all the presenters to go ahead and unmute yourself so that you can speak freely to answer questions. Um, I'd like to give uh, first Amy and Mike and, and then uh, Megan and Ty, a chance to maybe respond to a little bit of um, of Kelly's the point that Kelly made because she raised a lot of questions in her um, presentation. Okay, sure. Um, so, Kelly, I I actually do think that some of the interaction tasks that we've developed for data collection purposes here have some potential to get used in classrooms as a way of rather than telling kids you know, deep breathe when you're frustrated or whatever, to have them really think about, well, how do I, if I have to keep interacting with someone, how do I do that in a way, even if I'm frustrated, that's going to be effective and calm and not cause problems? So 
We um, have tasks like they have a very challenging figure to build out of Legos. One person gets the directions, the other person has the Legos. <laughs> um, and so the whole thing has to be done verbally. And they have, it's timed and there's time pressure and all. And, and it pulls for people's conflict styles and communication styles. So it absolutely is a context where it could be playing for. Um, and I, I like thinking about um, things in that context. And the, the notion of how to um, engage kids in relevant sorts of uh, prevention activities at the right moment so that um, they're off on the right track and not, um, not settling into dysfunctional patterns, I think so often kids hear us say this is the right way to do it, but as you were pointing out, the culture, the prevailing culture, it sends such strong messages that, um, that you know, it's easy to discount the grown-ups. My oldest son is three weeks into his first dating relationship, so all of this is extremely salient to me. <laughs> um, and in terms of the bilateral, unilateral um, kinds of aggression, I absolutely agree with you in terms of um, trying to make sure that we're understanding whether these patterns play out differently and whether dyadic process looks different in relationships that um, have different presentations of aggression. At this point, we don't have a large enough sample to allow us to, to uh, kind of partition things in that way, but ultimately, of course, um, wouldn't it be very nice to be able to know something about conflict processes that, that are vulnerabilities for particular signatures of aggression and would allow about those processes before anything even presents as aggressive? Um, so, yes, that's a direction that we're, we're hoping to be able to go as the research continues. Thank that's you. exciting. Yeah. I, I, had a, I had a couple of responses, too. Um, I... I you, you pointed out the possible, you know, wondering if if it would be a good idea to model teen dating couple relationships uh, on, on existing programs for adults, uh, violent, you know, adult relationships. And I, I think the answer is more or less a clear no. In in, in that the the main thing that's been taught that you know that we've learned from the, uh, the couple domestic violence uh, intervention literature is that the mean effect size is practically nothing. There is a um, there's a meta analysis Julia Babcock and her colleagues uh, uh, published a few years back showing that. I think the the main I, I think the in, in that that failure plus the fact that the, the tracks seem to be laid down in adolescence for how kids learn to be in relationships. Um, those, you know, that's the impetus right there to do things in a preventive setting. And of course, we, you know, we're learning about um, teen dating violence prevention. That there, there are some effects. Uh, uh, you know, programs like FOSHI's Safe Dates program and Wolf's Four R's and the new CDC um, initiative. That's, uh, you know, uh, uh, an extension of those. Um, and. Uh, and deepening of those interventions, uh, as well as a, a Jenny Lang Hendrickson Rowling's uh, Building a Lasting Love. Those are some interventions that you know we, we now know are showing uh, some preventive impact on teen dating violence. Um, and so I think timing is, is is a big issue. And you know some of these in some of these. So rather than doing old failed too late. <laughs> trying to repair something that's already broken type of interventions with couples, but really the action is uh, is in teen dating violence prevention um, as a means of both preventing uh, teen dating violence as it's occurring in the teenage years and preventing it from developing into just the way that these people are in their future relationships into adulthood. Um, so uh, I would... <laughs> So, uh, so I, I think we shouldn't repeat that. I think we should learn from the failures of the adult interventions. Um, as far as uh, the, the issues you raised with regard to bilateral, um, the bilateral nature of aggression, 
and you know, thinking about you know the context of self defense and things like that. I'm actually I'm a, I'm actually interested in what other people have to say on that based on the literature. I I know that in the adult literature, um, when if, if you ask about the precipitance of aggression, um, there's at least one or two studies, including one that uh, that Amy did uh, with Sue O'Leary, uh, showing that women's uh, uh, women are more likely. Are, are less likely than men to report self-defense as the reason for, for them hitting their partners. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're, they're saying that other events are precipitating that. There's also a more recent study um, from uh, Dan O'Leary, this is uh, also from Stony Brook, um, and this was in a college sample. It found something pretty similar. So uh, basically women who were, uh, you know, who were being, who were aggressive in, and these are college uh, women. Um, they were the primary reasons they were giving for engaging in physical aggression were related to anger um, and poor communication in the couple, rather than a self-defense motive. I don't know specifically, you know. So I mean, of course, college students are at the tail end of of adolescence. I don't know specifically about that issue. Um, in, and and you know, clearly, in like high school age kids. And yeah. clearly, those aren't treatment-seeking samples. Those aren't. Oh right, mm -hmm. yeah, actually, right. That's that's a, right. That's a great point. I mean, that that goes you know hand in glove with what I was saying before. Uh, the, the 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 adult literature is based on treatment-seeking samples, oftentimes court referred and things like that. That's trying to fix a problem that's already broken. So the whole the whole notion of prevention is is getting people. Um, you know, I mean, well, there are lots of different ways of doing it, but the way that we're thinking about it is uh, more from a from a universal. Um, you know, um, pre prevention standpoint of getting everyone in, not people, not you trying to engage as many people as possible, not just people where they're tr treatment seeking because, again, it's already there's already a dynamic that needs to be fixed. Michael, um, you don't breathe. Michael, Michael, you never you never breathe. Um, <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, I recognize, this is scary. Recognizing that we only have three minutes left and that Megan has not had yeah. a chance to jump in. I also wanted to add to um, what Kelly said, one of the questions from a participant um, who was asking about how much of a teenager's jealousy towards his or her partner is due to the realities of their behavior versus the reflection of uh, like cheating versus the reflection of their own insecurities. And I know that you don't specifically ask that question, but it, it made me think of um, some other research like Peggy Giordano has done about um, infidelity is actually a predictor also of dating violence. So I just wanted to speak to that issue around jealousy because uh, a participant raised it, I was thinking about it, and Kelly raised it. So let's talk about that. Yeah, no, that's great. Thanks, um, Carrie. And, and thanks, Kelly, for um, your thoughts and responses. I think they were incredibly important and insightful. I think the things um, that, that I take from them, one, or just the, the need for all of us to, to really um, sort of actively think about and include adolescents. I think we have sort of just tried to group them in with adults, and, and they're not, and we need to sort of in a different way support them, help them build healthy relationships, um, empower them. Um, it also kind of brings to mind a quote that actually I think came out of the HIV uh, research, but somebody taught in speaking about the HIV research said, um, statistics are numbers without tears. And, and I sort of think about that in your um, reflections, Kelly, that sort of all of our numbers need context and they need voice um, and they need meaningful interpretation and, and we need to really be, um, I think, very thoughtful about that. And so sort of taking our quantitative, our numerical results, um, but really thinking about kind of what does that mean for adolescents in general based on who they are in development um, and in particular for marginalized communities and, and how does this intersect um, with sort of long, history of racism and systemic oppression, and you talked about the sort of school-to-prison pipeline, um, and, and honestly, mass incarceration and how it's affected sort of adolescence and partnership and um, kind of within communities, and I think all of those pieces are um, incredibly important uh, parts of the discussion. 
Um, I, I think also when I think about how our results, what the next um, steps might be in terms of programming, I would love to see them used. Um, I, I hadn't thought quite as much about sort of the bystander approach in other adolescents, but I think um, can we empower adolescents uh, to sort of get those signals that they sort of learn as they begin to have those feelings how to protect themselves. So how, how can we um, kind of use the results to empower adolescents to gain insight into their own relationships, their own feelings? Um, in ways that are, are helpful to them. Thank you so much. Okay, and that is a perfect spot to end because I promised we would not go over time, um, and it is now 3.30, but I thank you all so much, and uh, especially for the presenters in um, being patient with us and redoing the webinar, and it involves a lot of coordination and, and work, and we recognize that, and we thank you very, very much. So. Oh, and if your question was not answered, uh, we will be getting to those questions and we can provide responses to those um, privately. Thank you.